So I was walking around trying to think of a good way to hook for this talk, as I often do. I spent a lot of time walking and thinking either alone or sometimes with groups. Um, so I can like distinctly recall being in this little town in the Netherlands uh, on a, like, a contract assignment. And we're trying to figure out like the data model of this insane application. And I remember like being on these cobble streets with my friend and being like, yeah, it's like it's like you put a little hat on, but then the hat can move over here and be reused by other people. I don't even remember what we were modeling, but like we didn't have a way to talk about what we were, what we were thinking about. And so we're just like around and searching for where we're going to name these things. And I was like, wow, there must be, I do this a lot, it's like walking. There must be a name for like people that walk around uh, and, and think, basically. Uh, turns out there is, peripatetic. Um, basically, it means you travel from place to place thinking and working, um, and sort of travel in short little bursts. Um, and the root of this word is interesting, it's peripate, which is basically just Greek for colonnades. Um, so there's a lyceum in Athens. Um, not everyone could afford to go inside an actual lecture, so Aristotle being poor would lecture by just walking around the outside colonnades. Um, so there's this Greek word that just meant colonnades, and eventually he actually transformed in ancient Greek to mean someone who's wandering around, even though like, it literally had another meaning, which is just that particular thing. Um, which is pretty cool. So I realize I like words. Um, I like the way they sound. I like the way that if you stare at a written word for long enough, uh, it begins to sort of lose its shape and meaning or look funny or wrong. Has anyone ever had that happen to them? Very cool. Uh, there's no word for that. Um, strangely enough, psychologists use a compound at neologism called uh, semantic saturation. So if you hear or see a word too much, it will begin to lose its meaning for you. Um, there are actually people that suffer from this as like a pathological disease where they literally can't make sense out of written words even if they're literate. Um, uh, so yeah, I like words. Um, for example, silhouette uh, has an incredibly precise meaning. It's basically like a shadow in profile. Um, and it was like a traditional way of making uh, portraits. You would take a piece of paper and looking at someone sort of cut their profile out and mount it on a white background. Um, and you could do this really quickly, three, four minutes out of like a street, street fair, but uh, fair just like by hand. Um, so it's obviously French in origin, um, but it has nothing to do with the French word for shadow, which you might expect, uh, which by the way is where we get the word somber. Um, which is like dull gray, you know, color. So where does so what come from? So as a French minister in 1759, um, during the Seven Years' War, France was having a sort of credit crisis, and the way he was going to solve this was by having like extreme taxes and economic demands. And he was incredibly unpopular, especially among the rich. Uh, because of his austere, austere economies, his name became synonymous with anything that was like done quickly and cheaply. And so, 50 years later, when there was a way of making these cheap outlines, uh, that word went from meaning just something that was like generally cheap to very specific meaning that we have today. Um, so it changed from the general word for cheapskate uh, into a very specific word for that type of portrait. Uh, cheapskate, by the way, does not come from skates. Uh, the word skate means an old broken down horse. The English word skates we get from Scots, which is a Dutch word for stilts, because they allowed you to glide along easily down muddy roads. I really like words. <laughs> Uh, so what do we consider to do with JavaScript? Uh, JavaScript is programming. Some might be surprised by this. And programming is ultimately about coming up with good words for concepts. This is a very famous uh, pithy quote. There's a, a variation on this that there are only two other things in computer science, cache and validation, and naming things after one errors. Um, words give you insight into concepts and ideas. You can't directly observe an idea. We actually have no way to know if like, the way I think about a thing is the same way you think about a thing. We only have the evidence of the way that we talk and write about it. Um, clear concepts have good precise words. Murky concepts often don't have good precise words. Um, we can't directly observe ideas. Um, does anyone know what this is? Yeah, so this, it, well, it's sort of. This is actually not a picture of dark heroes. Um, at the time, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the double helix was too small to take a picture of. The best you could do was shine light through where you knew it would be, and look at the refraction, and from that, try to guess what the shape was. It's a bit like being in a room with like a chandelier behind you and light shining. And you can only see the light and shadow that it casts, and from that, you have to imagine what the chandelier looks like behind you, which seems like an incredibly complicated process, and yet two people did it and won the Nobel Prize for it. 
since at the time the molecular structure of DNA was not directly observable, you basically you could just get this. Um, I like to think of words like this. Words are like a lens of what our idea is. We can't directly observe an idea. And so the best we can do is look at the way we talk about it as a proxy for um, its exactness, its precision, and what it means to us. Um, I would posit that imprecise words mean an imprecise idea. Um, so, the first cars were called horseless carriages. The only way they had to describe this new concept was by using the previous words from the previous concepts. And I think this hints that no one really understood what a car could or would be. Early cars retained many of the features of carriages in the past, including a place to put your buggy whip, even though you had no horse. Uh, interestingly, they even had patents for putting taxidermic faces on front of horseless carriages uh, to make people feel more comfortable, sometimes just a bust, uh, sometimes an entire fake horse, which of course came complete with uh, early headlights for illuminating the way, and an early horn for warning people on the their path. Uh, this is from patent 1895. So from 1895 to 1900, we somehow got to this, the automobile. We had moved from horses, carriages to a very precise term, cars and automobiles, within a few years. And then a few years more, we went to uh, the Ford Model A from 1903, and the Ford Model T from 1908. Between A and T, there were a lot of prototypes that never settled out the day. So uh, the presence of a neologism is a good indication that you're coming up with a new concept, especially if you're alone and borrowing words from the past. Um, but the best concepts have single words, and single words that are precise and mean only that concept. Um, ideas that are not precise uh, have compound words or borrowed words in the past, of course, it's courage. And I think single page app is an indication that we're in this sort of uh, part of the world where the concept of how we build web applications is in flux, and we don't know how to talk about it. Um, so let's, let's probe this a little bit and we present some evidence. Um, this is the New York Times. Would you consider this a single page application? So most people would say no. And yet there's 3.3 megabytes of JavaScript to render this page. Uh, here's Bustle. It's an uh, online magazine for women. Single page application. People might say also no. And it has much less JavaScript than the one megabytes to render this page. Uh, interesting, interestingly, it's built for JS, which is a you know, single page application framework. Uh, how about something more application like audio? Uh, you know, looks like iTunes, looks like Spotify, behave in a way that we consider applications to behave, and it has a URL. And when I navigate to something new, uh, the URL changes. So, is that a single page? Uh, from the user's perspective, certainly. So, <clears throat> let's remove some of our terminology and jargon and talk about what we're attempting to do when we write for the web. Um, it's just made up. I made this up last night while I was trying to think of a good way to talk about this. So the goal of writing for the web is to convey a universally referenceable piece of information that is structured and then send it over a network. And then from that context that we've delivered to another environment, you should be able to navigate to a new context that then becomes the universally referenceable content. Um, so by universally referenceable, I was saying URLs, and by structured content, I probably mean HTML and CSS, both the structure of the data and its visual structure. This means I'm probably excluding things like Java applets or Flash applications, Silverlight, etc. Um, so let's walk historically through how we've done this. Um, the web is networked with two sides of this interaction with a client and a server. And the client will request something that it wants. And in the early days, this would go uh, down to a web server, down to the web service file system or some subsection of it, and retrieve a file and then send that back onto the user. In fact, the web was referred to as the world's file system very early on. And this file that we send back is structured information. It has a URL, so it's universally referenceable. Um, and then, you know, this would be a web page, although web page itself is a stupid term because it's not really a page, it's more of a web scroll. But, you know, there you go. Um, but handcrafting each of these web scrolls, if you will, uh, is an onerous task. You can't imagine something like Amazon.com being entirely crafted by hand. Just the amount of people you need to employ and the processes you need to create to handcraft a page from millions of items is pretty crazy. So, of course, that is how they started, but not how they look right now. So we've replaced the web server and the file system with the web server and an application. Um, and so now we've broken the world's uh, file system. I think today we would say no, like the world's file system still works fine. People request things and we deliver files, and like it doesn't matter if these files don't actually exist on a file system. 
that they were okay, machine generates them for it, and uh, for us, and we were perfectly fine with this. Um, so, the user has a screen that would deliver up to them, and they want to move to a second screen. Here are the New York Times article from yesterday. Um, this translates to a new universal graphics or bit of information. Uh, and then the server dutifully generates a device to us. So is this like a controversial way of building, building for the web, would you say? Probably not. This is how we build for the web and have for like 15 years. Um, so what about this? You're looking at a, a representation of the screen and you want to show uh, something else, something new. In this case, um, a popover. Um, do you make another request and send back most of the same information with slightly different information augmented? Um, does that seem reasonable? And today you would say probably no, but it seems kind of crazy. Um, but why? Um, if these are two separate files, the cost of needing to create these files is too high. Um, especially if you're treating it as an actual file system, you have to go through and create variants. So if you imagine you have like tooltips and popovers, um, you have to create variants for like both of these tooltips are showing, or popover and this tooltip are showing. Um, and maybe if your computer is doing it for you, um, we still don't do this. Um, and so the why we don't do this, I think, is a question uh, that has a twofold answer. Um, <clears throat> is showing a popover, does that require a new universal context? Um, would someone want to store this information for later? Would they want to send it to their friend and share it? Um, in the case of a popover, probably not. This is not a context that's useful to share or store. Um, plus, sending back the same content uh, is a giant waste of resources, so we wouldn't want to do that. But, so, how do we solve this problem, though? If you want to click on the thing and show something different, how do we not go to the server, render mostly the same thing, and then send it back to the user? And the answer is you put a little application uh, in the browser. Uh, this application can control rendering uh, without making a request back to the server, but only after the application parses, uh, which can be inconsistent from the user's perspective. So sometimes your application is parsed and is running, and sometimes it is not, and you get different behavior, which can be frustrating. Um, so this, this kind of works, but it has some caveats. Um, all right, let's explore it in another real world application. Uh, let's talk about other types of interactions. So here's Airbnb. I'm looking at a particular page uh, for places in Ann Arbor. Um, does this page have a URL? Almost certainly. Uh, you loaded it to get here, so it must. It's a context that I'm likely to want to store for later, come back and look at, possibly share with friends I'm going to be traveling with. Um, here we are showing a pop over, in this case, a date picker. Um, does this interaction need a new context? In that case, it would be URL. Probably not. I don't want to share this. Uh, particular in an action, I'm like, unlikely to want to store this for later. It's ephemeral. Um, but <clears throat> when I make the selection, the data loads, does this need a new URL? Almost certainly. Um, I'm going to share this with friends. I might store this as like, okay, this is a, you know, this is our new vacation that we're going to do, and we're going to send this around. And then the problem we have is that transitioning from here to here, uh, we're keeping most of the page identical. So it's a waste of resources to send most of it back. So we have two options. Do the initial render on the server, uh, and then send a little tiny application that can do subsequent renders in the client. Um, and so this is a progressive enhancement, or PGEX style. Um, but now, we've duplicated behavior. We have to have rendering, full rendering on both client and server, URL generation, etc. And if you think you're going to get it right, I can guarantee you uh, you will not get it right. Here's a video of GitHub, so I'm going to make a comment. Cool. I'm going to make a comment. I'm going to go to a different website. <coughs> And then realize, like, oh, there's something else I want to say. Come back, and my comment is gone. I did it go. Or if I reload, I'll find it. Now, if GitHub can't get this right, I guarantee you will not get this right. So, uh, option two we can stop putting rendering and URL generation on the server at all. That's basically where we are kind of right now. Um, we didn't start this way, maybe we didn't realize this was an option. More likely, the browser was just not a fast enough rendering environment, and the tools we had, or the JavaScript, were not robust enough. Um, I mean, talk about some of these. So, pretty much this is where we are. Right? This, this is the state of art right now. Uh, you would perform a view rendering in the client. Um, some places have an excellent URL handling and routing. Um, let's put that little box off by itself. So the question uh, that someone who does progressive enhancement might ask is like, well, 
All right, but what about client environments that don't have JavaScript turned on? Maybe it's mostly a straw man. Now, if you look at the actual statistics, places that don't have JavaScript is shrinking and is already pretty small. Uh, the real question you should ask is, what about clients with constraints? Uh, rendering performance, networking, streaming real estate. Um, are we stuck here based on the fact that people are rapidly adopting mobile technologies? Are we always going to have to be doing rendering on the server for them and then rendering on the client for, um, for better clients? And I don't, I don't think so. Um, I think JavaScript is sort of unique. Uh, they can run on server and client. I'm not arguing that we would like run your full application on both, but you can do certain portions of it, like you and writing on the server, and then also have the same program on the client. So you can essentially ship like a fast boot of your application with pre-serialized data, also shipping with code, so you get a behavior immediately. Uh, subsequent renders and URL generation happen basically client side. Okay. So it's going much faster than we thought. Uh, but assuming we do that, uh, what would you call this in a case where this is ultimate server rendered, then it wakes up and it's client rendered? Um, does it match our goal? Does it contain something universally referenceable? Is it structured information? Uh, does it have the ability to look at local context and turn that into the new global context? Um, arguably, yes, it does. Um, so, uh, that's why I think single page, the term single page application is essentially like the web's versus code. I don't think it's a term that makes sense. Realistically, what will probably happen, and it often happens in cases like this, is we'll just refer to making things like this as making websites in the same way we always have. And we'll come up with a new term, sort of a back term, or a back term for uh, what it was like to do server sort of rendering. That won't end up with the new term. Um, Anyway, this went much quicker than I thought. Uh, that's actually all I have. So we can pause for questions. I've been building apps like this for a long time, so I'm happy to answer lots of questions. So I saw that you brought up the actual component of the back of the board. Oh, yes. Talk about that in the background. What would you say? No, no, I put it over its own little box because it does not have the form of view when they're in the interaction and it also has crispr routing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a router is essentially like a giant case statement, yeah. which does not at all capture the requirements of routing. People think that, like, oh, if you're doing client side rendering, basically detect the URL and then determine what to render. Um, but there's all sorts of additional things going on as routing. So you imagine the case of authentication. Someone visits your application and they're not allowed to be viewing a particular view based on their user role. Um, and so you want to like transition them to a place where they can say like I'm this person who actually has super admin access by providing this pass password. Um, all right, cool. How do you send them back to where they were? You basically want like transition objects um, and sort of more robust primitives for handling the notion of like transitioning between states. Um, that one just does not does not have this. Um, there are people who added better writing on top of that one. Um, none of it's been particularly great. Basically. As far as I've seen, Ember is the only router that works consistently. Um, generates URLs, back button works, forward button works. Um, it's pretty impressive. And it's based on a micro library, so like, just, that's a solid problem. Just please go use that micro library and, and stop fussing with routing if you're going to be doing client rendering. Um, but don't, don't eat that one. That's for the Angular UI router to solve it. Yes, uh, so, they, so Angular looked at Ember's router and was going to use the micro writer behind it. They're still in the process of figuring out exactly what their writing library is going to turn into. So Angular 2.0 router. Uh, Angular 1.0 router does not handle very deep nesting super well. Um, let me take that back. It's incredibly bad at deep nesting. Um, so basically, so if you don't know you're starting with deep nesting in Angular, you can write yourself into a position where you need to like start your entire app over with a different structure. Uh, the new router should fix that and potentially maybe based on this library. Yeah. It's I every time I see routing working poor, it's often a bad run application. It's hard to get right. You can get it right, but it's very hard to get right. So like as a framework, I don't think it provides you the necessary tools to do quite as robust as you need to like move fully into the client for applications. Yeah, we used to get support. So, router.js? Yeah. It's not that one specific. Um, it's just, so we'll see if crazy amount of stuff I have. Um, so, router.js, well, you can't see what I can see. 
switch over to, like, they send that link to someone who does not have Push State, so over the IE browser, over the Android browser, and it'll detect that and just automatically give them the hash, hash router. Yeah. And then same. Yeah. yeah. So, other questions? Yes? And then you mentioned you built a lot of these single page applications. Other than routing, what are some of the big challenges you run into in the techniques and um, so, I mean, routing is, routing is the tough one to crack. Um, not just from, like, it, it's very easy to detect a URL and then write a URL. That's actually very easy. Um, the, the tough part of routing is, is figuring out, yeah, like, what does routing represent? Um, and routing from server-rendered applications is something very different from client-rendered applications. Um, in server-rendered applications, routing is statements. Uh, because what is statements, right? It's like having a conversation with that guy from Memento. You have to constantly remind the web server, like, this is who I am, this is, this is what I would like. And the experience that we give users of sort of this continuous flow of web applications and illusion doesn't really exist. It's like, you know, watching a movie, those are just photos going very fast. There's no actual movement being captured. So they get a continuous experience because you redraw much of the frame as the previous frame. Um, in client-side rendering, you don't redraw the whole frame. And so you need to deal with the notion that, like, the URL actually ties to a particular state of the application. Um, and that state needs to be recreated from the outermost template rolling in towards inner nested templates because when you navigate away, you actually don't redraw the whole frame based on a new state. You just redraw the portion of the frame that no longer applies. Um, so that's a good one. Um, I, that's kind of the hardest part. I mean, view rendering performance is not a thing that, like, as an application developer, you're willing to solve on your own. Where, like, I guess if you were using something like that, then it may become a problem you need to solve on your own. I don't, I don't recommend doing that. That's a huge waste of resources. Like. Uh, the, the domain you're trying to work towards is like whatever your application is. So if you're building, you know, pinches for cats, uh, you need to worry about like what do cats like? What's the best way to show this so that cats will continue to buy cat advertisements on pinches for cats? You don't want to like think about like oh well, like how do I keep reflow from occurring because that's not your job. Um, so that's mostly just handled by by frameworks. And really, routing is the tough one. Um, I would I would say basically if your app doesn't get routing right doesn't count as a web application. Um, you don't have a universally referenceable uh, token that you can pass around and store. You don't have a web application. You're basically like a Flash or Java app, but you just have everything using HTML and CSS instead of Flash. But you have had an effect over the web. It occurs to me that the problem of the growth of the background is the browser and not being able to turn the pages to Yes. It will enable a bad design, bad web server. So the comment was, early backlogs has been around, around for a long time, uh, even on the server, thanks to things like CGI. Yeah, I think when we, when we moved away from the web server mirroring a portion of the, the underlying system's file system, um, and computers then generated these, these pages, it, like, we've been getting it wrong since then, basically. It's a very hard problem to solve. Um, I think on the server side, most of the people get it right now. Um, in fact, I would say, like, it'd be pretty complicated. It'll be working with some pretty bad tools to mess up the backlog. Now people do it, right? Like you've all seen the things where it's like uh, navigation by a form request submission. So you like, you know, if you hit the back button, you lose the context of your state. Um, or like storing the entire history of your interaction hashed as like a query parameter as many Microsoft technologies used to do, maybe still do. Um, very easy to like hit the back button a couple times and then try to go forward and it's like, well, we can't we create the state anymore? Um, so eventually, I think we get there. 
sort of universally for climate applications where your management and state is like, you don't even think about it. Um, hopefully the browser will begin sort of to emit better primitives for people to work with. Um, other questions? So we're having an email conversation, right? And uh, I use context because I'm a busy gentleman running around talking for preparing for conferences. And then you're like, hey, you never responded to me. We're chatting, you're like, and I'm like, oh, which email? Can you send me a link to our conversation in Gmail? Right, yep, that's true. You can't do that. And the same with calendar, right? Like, hey, are you coming to this meeting? Which one? Oh, go to your calendar, or the one at 2.30, the one that's in the room called whatever. But like, they definitely get the for a single user, they get the URL very light. Um, it, it, it rarely breaks, although I have seen it break on uh, Google Calendar, frustratingly. Um, when you're like editing an event that wipes the whole screen clean and you're working with it, if you hit, when you can go to like a new state about that event, if you hit back, it doesn't pop you back to the event, it pops you back to the calendar view. Right. Uh, but for the most part, you know, it's alright, except for like, the, the URL is not universally referenceable, but it's particular to a user's context, even though like we may show that context. Uh, whereas if you take like an article in the New York Times, like you don't get your own URL. Um, which so but we're close. I really I really wish I could lead people to events and Google Calendar into email conversations with Gmail. Are they with maps? Yes, they totally have the right with maps, but only after like seven years of getting it super wrong. Okay. Um, you mentioned that Node.js is not really a concern anymore. Do you do anything for Node.js? Oh, no, I, 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 I'm sorry, did I say Node.js wasn't a concern? <laughs> Node.js. Oh, Node.js was not a concern. Oh, uh, that's a strong Yeah, I mean, yes, uh, you can render. So the problem with, with dealing with situations where, so the question was, like, what about Node.js, not Node.js? So what about clients that don't have JavaScript? Um, is that still a situation you have to deal with? Um, in some ways, yes, but there are still clients that don't have JavaScript, and it's very minimal. It seems, in my experience, to mostly be tech nerds who turn off JavaScript as a hipster thing that they want to do, right? Oh, what you're saying? I didn't see anything because I don't have JavaScript on. Like, well, cool, turn off CSS and HTML that you see. Like, if you, if you try out one of the foundational technologies of the, of the platform, things don't work, shocker. Um, there are some environments that don't have JavaScript on. Very, very rare. Uh, the the actual problem is is like poor performing environments where you want to send out um, you know snippets of the application. Well, that's very hard to do and get correct. Um, there's no great tools for that yet. It'll probably, so one or two things will happen. Uh, rendering performance and and networking will get so so much better that it won't matter. What tools will come out that will solve this? But yeah, I don't. The JavaScript less, uh, so let's, let's even say you have a JavaScript less environment. Um, many interactions on the web are not just browsing. Um, and like, how do you, how do you recreate events? How do you re uh, recreate interactions that are not browsing without JavaScript? And the answer is you can't. And so like, do you, do you ship people a subpar? I don't know, it seems like, a, like from an economic standpoint, it seems like a waste of time to devote a ton of energy to a very small number of people. Yes. <laughs> Uh, the question was, what about web crawlers? Uh, Google has already fixed this to crawl in JavaScript sites. Um, they crawl under JS and Angular sites just fine. Um, other, you know, other places will also do this. They're, like, they're really desperate to get like you know into Bing search results for some reason. And they haven't yet stolen the search results from Google. Um, you can do, you can, you can start in a node environment, basically a web browser, and then send down the HTML. Uh, to the user, or if you're using something like React, um, React's uh, rendering layer uh, is sort of sort of generic platform JavaScript. It can run in Node or it can run on the browser. Uh, they've done a really good job of this. You can actually like, the 
the first time an application is hit, you can have React render on the server, and not render on the server and like it creates a fake web browser and hits your, your web page. Like it just renders HTML or actually downloads on the service and like sends them back um, preformed, but also sends back the, the JSX and JavaScript to like reform them later when the state changes. Yes. So the question was, is single page where everything is going, comma, is there still a place for server rendered applications? Um, so uh, the underlying question right there, uh, right there is like, is there a way to consistently do rendering across environments? Um, and the answer, I would say, is basically no. Um, it's very hard to get right. So the like, you know, large companies do it and get it very wrong. Massive companies spend a ton of money at Google and get it right. Um, so if you have any interaction uh, that doesn't need to create a new world, you're essentially shipping two applications anyway. One that's like sort of rendering up a already serialized bit of information, and then a little bit of client application that will look and be like, well, I can sort of peer at the bones of uh, the serialized data and figure out what the underlying data was and from that create new rendering. Um, or you want to do sort of larger chunked rendering, in which case you're going to end up recreating uh, templates, rendering logic, server, and client. It's very expensive to do and hard to do consistently. Um, so I think once you get in the world of wanting uh, better rendering performance or better interaction, uh, you end up with two environments. And for consistency's sake, one of them has to go. And that's probably the server. Um, the place where you might still do server rendering is if you literally just have no client interaction at all. Um, you're sending down a totally static document that has no, no additional behavior. In which case, like, doing the rendering on the client doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, with the exception of that, if you're, writing, if you're writing a property for the web and you have people that visit frequently, so they, they come once and then they turn to browse your site for hours, um, it's actually probably more performant to send down JavaScript and templates once and then when you're asking for additional data, you're basically just getting SIPs of unserialized data, I guess JSON serialized data, and then turning that to HTML for performance. But yeah, like, like server rendering, I think it's kind of nearing its end. Um, and I'm seeing this definitely in like the adoption of single page application frameworks and the like, I don't see it. So for example, I don't see anything interesting coming out of like the Rails world anymore. Right? Like Rails for Rails like, you know, had some more consistency, had like better uh, active relation behavior, it had turbo links, which is like their latest attempt to get you to not have to write JavaScript. Um, Rails 5, like, is coming out eventually, and I, I like, literally can't imagine for sort of rendering like, what new interesting thing they're going to get. Um, yes? Yeah, I have to think. One thing that comes up to me is the separation of the servers. Mm -hmm. Do a single page app is typically easier it's from a server standpoint when you're dealing with things like just pressing the service. Yep. Much easier to use those. Much easier to think about testing a single service and things like that. So you just change side, testing server side, render, you know, page image. Uh, so the comment was, from a separation of concern standpoint, it seems better to do intera UI interaction and view rendering on the client anyway, because then your server becomes sort of just data, um, which is very true. And this is especially true in worlds where uh, your client that happens to run in the browser runtime is just, just one of many clients you have. Um, so RDO is in this place. Many, many desktop applications are in this space where it's like, um, they have a mobile environment, they have uh, you know, a sort of traditional Windows or Mac, application, but then they also have web, um, and which is great, right? So you have all these client applications, and like, well, so, so imagine the counter example. So imagine Rails 5 opens up with Turbo Coco, because they decide that writing iOS applications is just incredibly hard, and so we're going to use the pain of doing that, but inside your Rails application, we will generate a Coco application for you. And you'll, like, someone will like, visit your web application, and we're somehow going to inject the Coco application onto their phone, and as they navigate, we're sending an important part of this Cocoa application, so that, like the iOS application, 
uh, it's basically generated on the server. Strong that kind of architecture makes it sound like totally crazy. And yet, for the past 15 years, that's basically how we delivered for the web platform, where we sent an application like bits of it pre serialized on the server into a client environment. That's very strange. More questions? Okay. About five more minutes. Uh, so the question was deep learning. What do you mean by deep learning? Yeah, so you say you're having to happen. Mm -hmm. Say a customer is building into your yep. company, so you have different parts and pieces, whatever. You know, now they're at a certain point, and they don't know. So it's a regular URL, so it's somebody else with their app yep. or something like that. I mean, beyond just your own parameters and such, is there any parameters you have to do that? No, great parameters, basically. Yeah. Um, you, you can run into the hard limit of sort of the, the maximum length of a URL. Um, so you'll probably want to like, this, this query of grams are probably not being human readable. There'll be some sort of encoded form of, of what they put together. If you have a finite number of com combinations uh, for like, you know, computer generation, you could like uh, do some bit wise math and make every combination essentially have a unique number, and you can send that around to people and then recreate that state uh, for someone else. That's all I have. Uh, feel free to follow me on various internet properties. Uh, part of Twitter is easiest to get a hold of me on that track on Twitter. Um, if any questions on your own, for us today. Thanks.